Good morning and welcome to the FCCJ. Um, I'm your moderator, Andy Sharp. Uh, I work for the Nikkei Asian Review. Um, so today we're going to talk about Japan, its economy, what's going to happen going forward in 2019, um, the risks, the challenges, what's going on with the BOJ. I mean, basically, I'm going to try and make this a, a free-ish um, forum. We've got 90 minutes. We've got a lot of time. We can ask a lot of questions about anything you're interested in regarding the Japanese economy. Also, I guess, global issues too. Um, but without further ado, I'll introduce our two guests today, two people I've known for probably close to a decade from the dark days before Abenomics. Um, so on my left is uh, Hiromichi Shirokawa, the chief economist at uh, Credit Suisse. And next to him is Adachi-san, um, who's the, Adachi Masamichi-san, sorry, the senior economist at uh, JP Morgan here in Tokyo. So both um, of our speakers will talk shortly for five minutes or so about what they're seeing in 2019, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Okay, um, who's going to go first? Okay, um, hi, nice to meet you, uh, nice to talk to you guys. Uh, my name is Masamichi Adachi. I'm working in the JP Morgan as a senior economist for the last 12 years, and uh, I'm now going to talk about the outlook of the 2019 of the Japanese economy, and probably more global economy as well. Uh, we believe that the uh, uh, 2019 Japan's economy faced two head, uh, headwinds. One is the uh, global uncertainties, and the VAT hike scheduled in October this year. For the uh, uh, global economy, as you know, from the uh, end of the last year, we got a huge I mean, uh, turbulence in the financial market, and that's definitely raised the uh, concern that uh, even U.S. economy may fall into the recession by end of this year. And we believe that's, that's too exaggerated, and definitely uh, we think the, uh, the global uh, health of the economy is not so bad as market has uh, priced in at the end of the year. But uh, at the same time, this is undoubtful that the uh, uh, uncertainties related to the politics in the U.S. and China, U.S. Tra uh, trade negotiations and the European political development, you know, that, that's kind of a, I mean, de definitely including a Brexit. Uh, that's kind of a unpredictable risks definitely persist. And another unpredictable thing is how corporate uh, globally uh, behave to these kind of uh, uh, uncertainties. But at the same time, as you know, uh, you know unemployment rate globally is continue to fall and uh, wages in the US and Europe is gradually rising, meaning that the consumers should be fine at least uh, uh, for a while. So we believe that, you know, as I said, uh, global economy is facing a, a sort of downturn, but uh, the pace of uh, slowing and moderation, it's a more moderation rather than the uh, uh, recession. So from that perspective, Japanese economy should be fine uh, as long as the global economy is just moderating, not uh, in a, getting in a sliding into the recession. And then the VAT hike, uh, value added tax, I mean consumption tax hike, that's definitely a big uh, uh, headwind, for, I mean big drag for the Japanese economy. As you probably remember, in 2014, we got a big hit, and it was probably much larger than the many people had expected. But, you know, the Jap Japanese government has definitely learned from that experience, meaning that they prepared a lot of the fiscal uh, support to against this drag. But uh, you know, in the short term, in the fourth quarter of this year, it's probably inevitable to see the big contraction of the GDP. But the real challenge for the Japanese economy is a recovery in the 2020. So maybe you know, I should say the uh, uh, Japanese economy will face a very big volatility around that time. But at the same time, because of this fiscal support, uh, I believe that the Japanese economy can pick up to the uh, around 1% growth in the 2020. So, you know. Basically, uh, some noises, some volatilities, and some concerns persist, but economy should be fine. And but I, at the same time, I, I want to add one thing: that the inflation in this country will not rise much. So that's definitely a big trouble for the BOJ, and the BOJ cannot move for quite a long time. That's my remarks. 
All right. Um, I think um, the um, our view um, about the global economy uh, what can be characterized as um, decoupling uh, between the manufacturing slump and tight labor market conditions, which are supposed to end up in consumption. So we have very strong view about uh, quite limited uh, about the probability of the recession of the global economy this year, uh, which is the you know very low probability, mainly because of the remaining tight labor markets uh, in the U.S., uh, Europe, and Japan. Um, so we are looking for actually slight decline of the growth rate. Um, the for global growth rate. Uh, we actually put 3.2% uh, last year. We are expecting down to 3.0% this year, so slight slowdown for the U.S. from 2.9 to 2.6%. Uh, Eurozone from 1.9 to 1 1.5. Uh, but I think, again, we're not expecting recession, except a few economies such as uh, Turkey and Argentina. Um, so industrial or developed economy should be all right even though, uh, again, we tend to expect uh, fairly uh, significant uh, production correction in the near term, maybe Q1, Q2 this year. Um, on the Fed, um, our working assumption is that two hikes, um, but the second half of the year. We have changed the view recently from uh, hike in March and hike in September but we now say the first hike this year of this year would be delayed to September. So September and December is our current call, so two hikes. So this is mainly because of our near-term pessimism about the manufacturing sector, uh, in particular for the first half of the year. Um, and risk, many risk factors in the global economy, of course, you know, the possible further, um, uh, you know, the worsening of the trade disputes between the United States and the China, uh, which could be, of course, you know, um, dampening global trade activities, uh, maybe pushing down commodity prices, uh, and um, uh, also maybe, you know, um, technology sector may be hard hit by that. Uh, but for the moment, we do not think the U.S. Uh, import tariff for China of the another $200 billion will be raised to 25%. So uh, we're not expecting any major, major uh, worsening of the trade relationship, uh, trade disputes between the two countries. Um, but of course, risk is that you know, we may be wrong, and the Trump administration will be even even uh, introducing uh, harsher, uh, you know, the actions to uh, with China, and that that would of course change the landscape somewhat. Uh, also, um, for the Chinese economy, we're expecting slowdown from three point, uh, sorry, six point six to six point two percent this year. Um, but but I, I think the, you know, that does that forecast. Uh, assumes the re-expansion of the credit growth. So we are fairly cautious about the Chinese manufacturing activities. So even expecting the expansion of credit growth in China, we are expecting slowdown. And the, for China, uh, I think the main issue would be whether or not a uh, corporate debt problem, which has been sitting for some time already, uh, is getting bigger or uh, becoming a, the main focus of the markets. So far, uh, I don't think the market people in general are so concerned about the Chinese corporate problem. But if the trade dispute's getting uh, you know, worse and commodity prices go down and China's corporate profitability deteriorates significantly, uh, markets may start to look at the corporate debt problem in China. That's going to be risk. Uh, and soft landing would not be that easy, uh, mainly because of the China's property markets have already stretched quite meaningfully. So that is our concern. Uh, and finally, on, on Japan, um, 
we have a sort of data view. Um, should be all right, that's it. And the, this is mainly because we're not expecting BOJ to do anything meaningful in terms of the normalization. They'll get stuck. Um, and the, um, as Adat san talked about, the fiscal countermeasures to VAT hike, uh, fiscal policy will remain so so friendly with the economy. And unless we assume the global recession, uh, Japanese economy can grow close to 1% this year again. And we tend to think that the Japanese households have um, ample savings um, or some you know, the prepared money for a VAT hike, so it would be all right. Um, of course, you know, the other thing is the construction sector is still enjoying uh, you know, the many projects in the pipeline. Um, one risk for the Japanese economy would be some you know, possible some correction in, 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 in the part of the property markets, uh, maybe apartment, apartments, maybe because of credit tightening, a bit of the over, over construction, and the vacancy is now picking up, and regional banks may be hit by that. Um, so risk factor in particular for the Japanese economy would be uh, a part of the property markets. Uh, but having said that, again, I, I would expect one percentage number for this year, uh, assuming the BOJ would, would do anything. Uh, CPI inflation rate, as other some talk about, um, uh, you know, if you exclude energy and, and food, uh, maybe, you know, cannot, uh, you know, um, Take a take, make a takeoff from around around 0.0 percent. So very stable 0 percentage number for the core core CPI, and risk is a bit on the downside depending on the currency. So could be slightly negative number for core core CPI this year. I stop here. Okay, thank you very much, very both both of you. Okay, so open to questions now. Um, when you ask a question, raise your hand, and then I'll pick you and then give your name and affiliation. Um, we'll try and keep this as, as open as possible. Um, and also, if possible, could you direct your question to one of the speakers or to both of them? Okay, anyone to start? Also shy? <laughs> no question. No question. Wow. It's okay, here we go. Patrick Welte, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and Neue Zürcher Zeitung. Uh, how much are you concerned about the, develop the recent developments of the yen exchange rate? And is this going to be, yeah, is the yen going to get stronger during the year? And how would this impact your quite nice outlook for the Japanese economy? Both? To both, of, to both, both? speakers? Patrick, yeah. To both. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. I hope so. Uh, let's try to have a different opinion thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think um, the um, volatility of the exchange rate market has picked up to the end of the year. But of course, you know that is in a sim market situation, and 104 was observed. But uh, again, coming back to 108 level. So if the yen uh, hangs around what well, between 108, 112. Not a big change in, in, in the core range. Uh, I think the, uh, to be simple, neutral to, to economic growth. Uh, but of course, you know, the, that is um, you know, <clears throat> totally unsatisfactory for CPI to pick up, right? So we need some weaker currency if we want to see uh, better inflation numbers, like you know, about 1%, for example. Um, so at the moment, we would say if the currency remains the current level, I think the budget is neutral to economic growth. Uh, but of course, you know, the, the question is whether or not the currency starts to strengthen further from here. And our view on the currency is that 105 is quite possible this year. Um, it's staying at 105 level rather than just one touch 105. And this is mainly because of the uh, change, you know, the changing expectations in the market about the Fed late hike cycle. So we have already heard from the chairman 
of the Fed that they can make a pause for the moment, and that's why we are saying no, no late hike in the first half of the year. I think the what would be important is what is the background of the Fed to stop hiking? Just wait and see. And they continue to say we can raise interest rate in the second half of the year or full stop. And our view is they can raise again interest rates in the second half of the year. Uh, but of course, the risk is that the market could say or could um, you know, uh, discount or price in no more hikes after March FOMC meeting if they decide on no change. And then interest level would go down again I mean, the United States, and then the yen could be appreciating, and uh, you know, uh, maybe maybe breaking 105, touching 100, and then we'll, picture will change somewhat, growth and inflation and so forth. So, um, so again, again, for the moment neutral, but the risk is that the yen could appreciate, and then you know we have some possible um, you know impact on GDP on the downside. I don't know how much, but if the yen goes goes up to 100 and stay, uh, I think the growth rate would be maybe um, lower than our current forecast by roughly speaking by three tenths, maybe four tenths. We are, we're kind of expecting one zero for current year this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I try try to differentiate the view a little bit. I mean, at least a little bit. Um, and basically, you know, uh, we have very similar view on the Fed. We are expecting two hikes starting from July and December, and we used to say four times. We have uh, JP Morgan used to be a uh, hawkish, but now, I mean, until November last year, we were always said four times, four times, four times, and in December we divided down to three times, and now twice. So you know, basically, we just coming to the market consensus. But uh, but at the same time, I have to tell you, the future market is already pricing the rate cut, not just only pause, you know, to, I mean, if you include the 2020. So from that perspective, if our view is right on the US, the US Fed start raising a rate again in July. That means interest rate differential makes the dollar strengthen again a little bit, and, and it probably goes down. So we are expecting an end should rather depreciate rather than appreciate at the moment as a central view. At the, currently, we are expecting, I think, not 120, but between 115 and 120. That's still possible. That's what we believe. But I, that's a house view, right? My personal view is a little bit more concerned that the uh, maybe market is more concerned on recession in 2020 or 2021, which means even the Fed rate hike continues, people pricing the risk off uh, environment, and that makes the end to appreciate. And but uh, near term risk is probably Shirakasa didn't mention is the trade dispute between the Japan and the U.S. As you probably know, that the uh, from uh, February, I think it's February, yeah, the trade negotiations start between the Japanese government and the U.S. government. So if the U.S. government uh, sticks to the idea that the uh, Japan can no longer manipulate the currency and this manipulation include the uh, you know BOJ's monetary policy, then it's easy to say that they end to appreciate below 105. That's my personal sense. So if the end goes to 100, yeah, maybe the growth impact is probably similar. A couple, of, I mean, not not 1% or something. Maybe maximum 50 basis point. <coughs> not recession, but uh, still huge drag. And uh, probably government will be very very upset on that. And uh, it's very it's a very trouble for the uh, BOJ as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll chip in with a question, if you don't mind. So it's been, I think, nearly six years since Mr. Kuroda became the uh, BOJ chief, um, the governor. And he came in, of course, promising, you know, big, bold steps for 2% inflation. Of course, six years on, we're nowhere near that. Do you think that Mr. Kuroda is serious about getting this 2% inflation? Or does he need to? And if he is serious, does he have any tools left in the kit monetary tools in the kit to get this. I'll address this to both of you, maybe starting with uh, Shirakawa-san. Well, um, I, I don't know about the Kuroda-san's uh, personal, personal take of the situation, but I think the Bank of Japan has already budgetly given up by chipping 2% inflation rate. 
it's quite obvious because they have continuously downgraded their forecast of inflation. They are now expecting CPI um, unlikely to two percent even into the end of the 2020. And, but in the, in the meantime, they have done tapering, so means budget given up. So you know they cannot do any uh, sort of you know normalization monetary policy uh, in any sense. Uh, if they do really want to achieve 2% inflation. So I think 2% inflation target has already gone, uh, budgetary, I think, speaking. Um, and the, still, the currency doesn't matter a lot for the inflation rate in our understanding. So uh, they have tried not, you know, not to make the yen breaking 105, touching 100, obviously. So it's, it's sort of implicit. Um, target for the yen, you know, seems you know below 105. So the question is whether or not the you know BOJ really moves if the yen breaking 105 down to 100. That's a key, and I do not think Kurosan will be tolerate, uh, tolerating that situation. So what is what what they can do? And some some clients or the investors are expecting the acceleration of QE, so reversing the tapering is one view. The other view is maybe uh, it's not a majority view, but the, they may start to cut interest rates again. Uh, so expanding negative interest policy, which is politically a bit you know, painful, but that is not necessarily totally off an option risk. And third one, maybe in my understanding, the BOJ may start to buy foreign, foreign securities in, some, in, in, in any form. But you know the such a kind of emergency or um, totally unprecedented measure would require a situation where BOJ uh, is able to justify uh, no more QE expansion using JGB markets. So it means uh, that third option would be still remote. So I, w I still think that BOJ may start to re-accelerate QE if the yen breaking 105, touching 100, risk is on even below 100, they, they, will, they will not uh, be able to just stay uh, doing nothing and, and I think wait and see. It's quite impossible, I would say. But that risk so far um, I see fairly small for the moment. Uh, I think Trump will be so-so friendly with Japan, Abe-san, in the understanding, for the moment, at least. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, about the Kurosan's uh, thinking, I, I personally believe that the, uh, he still believes 2% inflation is necessary in this country, and he really wants to achieve it. And, but the, I think he understands the uh, sort of social recognition or maybe even political recognition that the, uh, this 2% is not demanded or not wanted by the uh, social, in, in, uh, in the society in general. I mean, I, I mean w w even the, you know, uh, Prime Minister Abe said that the uh, uh, BOJ is doing a good job and uh, they are trying, both government and central banks trying to achieve this 2% inflation, but we don't see any sort of a desire or any wishes from the government to, say, uh, to uh, pursue the, this 2% inflation target. I mean, BOJ is definitely independent on that sense that the, from the government that to achieve the, uh, uh, this target. So, and also, as you probably know, there's many side effects of these current policies, uh, in, especially the low interest rate making the regional banks in trouble. And so further easing in, under the normal situation looks extremely difficult. So uh, even though Kurosan still believes that the 2% inflation is desirable, uh, going back to the uh, uh, question on the, what toolkit they have, I think that there will be no more meaningful toolkit by the BOJ itself. I mean, if the BOJ has an option to coordinate with government, it may be possible to, you know, sort of a, uh, theoretically it's possible, I say, that to coordinate with government and doing a sort of a helicopter money policy, or maybe at the moment people call it a drone money policy to specifically the uh, you know, fiscal expenditures for the monetization. That's kind of policies, you know, 
experimental and gambling, but it's still possible. But I don't think the society or politicians or government wish to go that way. Therefore, there will be no meaningful way to achieve the 2% inflation in a reasonable time horizons. But going back to the point that the, uh, if the Japanese economy facing a real serious problem of recession by uh, appreciation of N, Maybe, I don't say 105, but I say maybe 100. But uh, in that case, I believe that Kuroda uh, san will do what he said. He said that he has a still tool to go, uh, to, I mean, he has a still ammunition to ease by cutting uh, yield curve control, buying more assets, increasing more base money. And, you know, that's, I think, still possible. And, uh, and I do not believe that the uh, Japanese government allowed the BOJ to buy foreign assets because it is a currency manipulation. That's what the Trump administration would be quite upset. Therefore, that option is probably impossible. But current pol extension of the current policy is still possible and quite likely if the end goes to below 100 and that's sustained for a while. I mean, the expectation that's sustained for a while. I think the BOJ, has, I mean, Kurosan has no hesitation to go that direction. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay, leave some questions from the floor. Um, working press or associates or visitors, um, anyone is welcome to ask a question. You want to go again? Tom, you know, got a question? <laughs> Uh, Thomas Sullivan, my name. I'm a visitor here today. I wanted to ask you uh, just quickly about the automobile sector. We've seen some very big layoffs in Europe overnight, and we saw uh, General Motors also closing some facilities in the United States. Is this a concern for you uh, in Japan? And could I also ask you, Mr. Mr. Gon's lawyers were here earlier in the week. Do you see any macroeconomic impacts of, in terms of investment into Japan or outbound uh, M&A because of this uh, issue? Thank you. And it's directed to... Oh, to, to both of them? Okay. Awesome. Okay, then this time I start, all right? Okay. Uh, automobile sectors, yes. Uh, the biggest concern for Japanese automobile sector at the moment is definitely this trade dispute between the Japan and the US, and also uh, more broadly, uh, uh, the uh, Trump administration's policy on this automobile's import to the US. If the uh, US government very seriously raised the uh, tariff, from anywhere in the world, then that's definitely a big issue. But at the, uh, I do not believe that the uh, Japanese automakers are you know, cutting uh, <laughs> their workers in this country. As you know, the, our labor practice is very difficult to fire people. Therefore, I don't think that that's an uh, option is, uh, is available for the Japanese automakers. Maybe that will happen in U Europe or US or China. That's maybe possible. I mean, I'm talking about the Japanese companies firing uh, foreign workers, that's maybe possible, but not the Japanese workers. So from Japanese economic perspective, I do not think that's a real serious problem at the moment. And uh, uh, related to the uh, uh, Mr. Gon's issue, Unfortunately, I mean, I, I cannot tell about the individual case of the uh, uh, specific company, so uh, sorry for being a very sort of naive uh, answer, but uh, my sense is, uh, the, it's getting harder for the Japanese company to hire uh, foreign CEOs. I, that's my sense now. I mean, it's getting harder, I feel. And, but at the same time, uh, that, would that change the uh, picture of the macroeconomy? My answer is no. So for the corporate Japan, some impact, but not for the macroeconomy. That's my answer to your question. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, we have to remember that the economic recovery, medium-term cyclical recovery in, in, in the U.S. and Japan started uh, in the middle of 2009 and already almost 10 years. And if you take a look at the United U.S. auto sales, um, hanging around uh, 17 million you know, Panium car sales for some time, but it seems to have been peaking. And 
from here on, I think the gradual, uh, I think the decline of the old sales is, is, is quite possible uh, because of the already, you know, pent up demand has been uh, taken care of, the, you know, uh, uh, cyclically speaking. And also China's auto sales, you know, do not look, uh, you know, going up from here meaningfully. So maybe high level, but not necessarily uh, continuously growing from here without much of the uh, government support. So all the sector in general uh, may take some cautious stance uh, in, a, in, in that situation, in a cyclical peaking, and plus maybe trade disputes between the US and other countries. So um, it is not easy for us to say uh, old sector is growing from here uh, as, as, as what, you know, uh, as like they did over the past, you know, several years. Um, the old industry, generally speaking, in, in my personal view, uh, I think the key is which country is a leading, will be the leading country in terms of the electric vehicle. So EV, so, um, you know, Chinese makers, as you know, have been doing so far so, so well in terms of the EB, um, you know, the manufacturing. And that is a big issue for Japan and the United States. And that would be uh, part of the, you know, technology transfer issue between the US and China. Because China is so interested in EV technology. And from that perspective, this is not, not, it is not house view, but my personal view is that Nissan is a leading company of EV. <coughs> so you, you, you have to read between the lines. Do you know what I mean? We've got Tesla, Nissan. I stop here. You have to think about, you have to, you have, to have your imagination what I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying. Why those guys are in trouble? Do you wow. know what I mean? Wow. You should be kind to everybody. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, you know, as I said this, I think you have to, you have to understand what is I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. So I, I cannot say about the individual company. Mm. So this, you know, my job is, is, is you know, talking about the Japanese economy, not a individual industry. So I would say several keywords. Technology transfer problem. US is worried about technology transfer and EV to China. Which companies are leading company in EV in the industrial nation? Answer is obvious. If you do not understand this, I think it's, it's a bit surprising to me. <laughs> I think they might understand, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, any um, questions? Maybe not on the auto industry. Uh, <laughs> just uh, um, sure. Go ahead. Uh, Patrick Welt once again. You talked about monetary policy and the macroeconomics. Uh, I would like to ask you to talk a little bit about fiscal policy and economic policy, so the other two arrows of the so-called economics. Is there anything left in terms of structural reforms with this government? And we have seen, second question, we have seen this decision about immigration, that there might be some several how many ever coming to Japan over the next five years? Do you expect that these people are going to come? Is this really going to happen? And what might be the impact on the Japanese economy? Is this going to change the macro picture in terms of fundamental growth, the structural growth potential? On the, uh, on the fiscal policy, I mean, 
as I said, the government has already uh, had a budget for the fiscal year 2019 to offset the drag from the VAT hike, and so they're trying to be neutralize this the tax hike in at least in the short term. And but in the medium term, they are basically following to consolidate the uh, I mean reducing the fiscal deficit and trying to achieve the primary balance by 2025, which looks mission impossible. But uh, still, that's the direction that the government is trying to do. And my sense is, you know, the government and the society in general feeling this kind of gradual uh, consolidation is what the you know, everyone likes. And nobody is wishing to see the big fiscal deficit. No, nobody wants to see the uh, uh, government debt continue to rise so rapidly or something. So gradual healing is what the uh, government is trying to do. So from that sense, I, I do not think there will be any big surprise from the fiscal policy beyond the, uh, I mean, at, at, at least there will be no recession in the next couple of years. That's, that's one point from the fiscal policy. And the structural reforms, I think the biggest uh, change in the last couple of years is a definitely this immigration issue. I mean, even though the government doesn't say this is immigration, but definitely this is a, a common uh, definition of the global standard that this is a part of the immigration. And uh, I think this is a still a baby step, but that's a favorable change in my country, I feel, that the, we are trying eventually uh, uh, accepting the uh, uh, reality that we need more uh, low-skilled workers from uh, overseas, I mean, low income, uh, from low-income countries. And I believe that uh, the government plan to increase the uh, uh, foreign workers in the next five years is quite achievable. Uh, so uh, I, I, I take it as a favorable change. However, does it really change the Japanese potential growth rate from current uh, less than 1% to the 1.5%? I'm quite skeptical on that. And I'm, uh, you know, the big macro pictures for the next five years, it, because of this uh, accepting immigration, will it change? I'm, bit, uh, I'm not so optimistic on that. But there's a possibility that the uh, society will accept more uh, foreigners more easily, and uh, this diversification of the labor force will change the uh, labor practice in this country. So gradual baby step change may raise the uh, possibility that we can change. I mean, it's definitely different from the uh, uh, five years ago when there's no chance at all that this country will accept immigration as a formal sense. It's, so uh, that, that's my feeling. Uh, <clears throat> I think the on the fiscal side, uh, the key issue is uh, how to control medical expenditure. Uh, we have some uh, macro system of, con you know, um, controlling pension payment, but on the medical side, uh, I think the system itself is, I think, the looser means they have to continue to introduce some measures to cap uh, net medical expenditure, medical expenditure minus, I think, the you know, insurance premium revenue and so forth. Um, but in the mean, but I, we haven't yet seen any major initiatives taken by the government on this medical reform. Even though we know that the government has been more uh, in favor of, or putting more pressure on uh, the private sector to use genetic medicine, for example. But anyway, I think the the focus is on medical expenditure control on the fiscal side. Um, but in the meantime, other than that, nothing really happening in terms of the administrative reform, public sector reform, and pension reform is, is now sort of uh, getting, uh, what I mean, stopping in, 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 in a sense, because not, not, I think, the new measures on controlling pension payment. Um, but this is mainly because of the central bank's monetary policy or monetary, sorry, debt monetization. I think the essence of the BOG policy is not achieving 2% inflation. It's very obviously they're just buying bonds, keeping interest rate level as low as possible and helping the government. That's it. But that has been helping the government a lot. And even though 204% of debt to GDP uh, interest cost is only, you know, right now 9 trillion yen or something like 1.6% 1. 1. Uh, 1 of GDP. So uh, still I think the debt services have been uh, well controlled. 
This is because of the central bank. Um, but that, I think the flip side of this is the remaining limited pressure on the government to do any fiscal reform. And relating to that, I would say government has already decided to go for immigration, in my view. I don't know why Prime Minister Abe continues to say it is not immigration policy. This is an immigration policy, definitely. So they want to see continuous inflow of foreigners coming to Japan, helping population, helping fiscal situation. And of course, you know, the, to some extent, the, uh, you know, easing the supply shortage, so the labor supply shortage problem in construction services and so forth. Uh, I would say that, uh, roughly speaking, 200,000 foreigners uh, infra from here, or even somewhat faster, uh, under economics, uh, 4.5 million jobs have been, has, has been created, uh, 4.5 million, and out of that 4.5, foreigners, roughly speaking, 1.0 million over the past six years. So uh, that situation, I would say, will even gather momentum. And this is mainly because the, um, so far, the general public's resistance to foreign workers, foreign people, is limited. And in my view, opening the tourist market to the outside of the country uh, actually is, is uh, I put, said that back in a year ago, that was the test by the government about the people's feeling about foreigners coming to Japan. I'm not talking about you. You guys from, you know, since a long time ago, you know, well taken by Japanese, you're journalists and so forth. But what we are talking about the, uh, you know, as, as Adesan pointed out, I think, saying the, you know, bit more lower, lower, you know, income countries like Asia and so forth. So um, that's why government has decided, okay, people are okay. We're gonna go for that. And maybe acceleration of the you know, immigrants infra, I would say. Construction, and even they can take their family members. That would help consumption and so forth. So uh, I don't say potential GDP is picking up. This is to try to underpin potential GDP. Uh, headwinds from the labor uh, supply shortage. Uh, so maybe two tenths, three tenths impact would be there. So without this immigration policy, Japan's real potential GDP growth may be going down to you know, some negative number in, in decade time, but that could be avoided. One concern is the society. Is it really prepared for accepting a significant increase in the number of foreigners coming to Japan? But at the moment, our view is It'll be okay. Uh, so, so I think the, the, that policy is a key. So we found that, oh, this is a key of Abenomics. Abenomics is the debt monetization and immigration. So no reforms, no fiscal reform, no industrial reform, no painful reforms. <coughs> so Abe is run out of ideas. Uh, can, 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 I go to, yeah, can I go back to the, his sure. point? I mean, he said that the uh, fiscal, when government debt service cost is so low because of the BOJ. I mean, of course, it's true that the BOJ is buying a lot of bonds, and uh, that's definitely helping to the uh, low, uh, yields so low. But I have to tell you that this country has been uh, current account surplus for such a long time, 30 years. And as you may know, as you probably know, the Current account surplus means the uh, net saving, I mean, saving minus investment in this country is always positive, net saving, even though government making a fiscal deficit. That means we have an abundance of the cash in, the, in saving in this country. That makes the yields so low. And also, inflation has been so low. I mean, it's not the only BOJ that makes the government uh, debt uh, service costs so low. Uh, I want to emphasize why BOJ is not succeeding this inflation target is the reason why government is so easy to make a fiscal deficit continue such a long time. So it's a really, uh, it's not just a BOJ's failure or something. It's a real struggle, I mean, social and economical structural issue that makes the BO, uh, government continuously making the uh, fiscal uh, government debt to rise. 
So uh, I personally feel that yeah, uh, criticizing a BOJ on this issue is a little bit too exaggerated. I, that's my first point I want to highlight. And second point I want to highlight on this uh, immigration issue, I mean, maybe a, 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 a Abenomics issue, I should say. Yes, it is true that the uh, Abe's administration, I mean, Prime Minister Abe did not do any painful reforms, and I call this, uh, but uh, I call this is a sort of a soft populism. That makes the uh, avoiding the uh, hard populism we see in the Europe. So, positive side of Abe's policy is this gradual, very gradual, but still some progress of the change in society. And I, have, I haven't talked about this structure issue, but government is now trying to transform the society that adapt to the uh, life expectancy longer to the 100 years compared to, say, 70 to 80. So I don't know whether it's successful or not. I mean, it would be successful or not, but the direction is, I think it's the right way. I, I'm rather, I'm always definitely uh, against the uh, Prime Minister Abe usually, but after these immigration issues and after this uh, change, transforming a society to the li longer life expectancies to 100 years, I feel a little bit of the hope that that may progress further. But I don't think Abe can finish that. I think the post Abe is more important on this issue. All right, that's my my. So you're not conservative. I don't say conservative. I'm probably pro pro pro. Uh, so you're more liberal. More, more liberal, I okay. feel. I'm more. I'm. I'm, I'm putting I'm, myself I'm more conservative. Maybe yes. Yeah. <laughs> because you're older than me. <laughs> I don't think it will work. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I'm not. I'm not talking about it's workable. <laughs> I'm saying that direction is. I mean, you know, policy. Or, it's different from the other countries. Different, I mean, other countries like UK and US is what they're doing right now is they are controlling immigration. We are now opening the markets. Yes. So 180 degrees different. Yes, that's so true. Are we lagging or are we ahead of the curve or behind the curve? Well, we have very different situation between the US, uh, I mean, I mean uh, Anglo-Saxon countries and Japan. In Anglo-Saxon countries, even without immigration, population still continue to rise. But here, population is shrinking. I think the situation is quite different. Okay. And, and, and one thing, one advantage of this country is we can learn from the mistakes in Europe and the US. <laughs> I mean, potentially, I'm saying. All right. I mean, definitely, we, ha we have to learn from the mistakes of the Germany or many European countries to accept uh, too many uh, foreign, uh, foreign workers in the short term. How is the balance protecting our culture and society and immigration? What is the view? Uh, I think the... Uh, I'm a bit concerned. Yes, I'm. I'm also a bit concerned. But the, mm, I, I think You're this. The, yeah, I'm liberal. <laughs> so I think it's important for the local government or local societies be more prepared for the accepting of foreigners more more seriously. I don't think this is a central government task to adapt the more foreigner work. It's more day by day business uh, life life that affect the society. Therefore, local government or local communities should be more involved into this change of the society. And I don't know how, how it works, but uh, that, that, that should be done. Okay. I'm probably too liberal, maybe. No, no, I understand, I understand. I think it's not the job of the prime minister, maybe. No, it's not, it's not. I mean, I think the prime minister can sort of give the guideline or give the big picture and the people choose. That's what uh, should be done. But prime minister hasn't given any of course not. He had guidance. I no. mean, my, 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 my sense is that Prime Minister Abe is, is so indecisive. Yes. And he is sometimes you know, saying a bit of the lie kind of thing. So he's lying, right? It's immigration. It's immigration, right? So what you have to say, that we need immigration. We need to do this for fiscal, for example. I will be uh, happier to help him, right? Mm -hmm. Or support him. But I think the, it's not immigration. We are fine. Yeah. And that, that's a problem because I think the local government, for example, have to follow what the prime minister is saying and what, what they have to do. So they're getting stuck. But I think the European is my local government top or officials could be all right. I mean, you know, realistically tackling with issues. So we trust more on the local communities and the governments. I, I, I would, I think, you know, uh, appreciate the view. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, over here, please. Uh, 
Yeah, my name is Kurt Sieber. I'm an associate member. Um, I'm also a customer of Credit Suisse, and I'm declaring my assets in <laughs> Switzerland every year on the uh, my tax return. So uh, I'm not going to run into any gone problems. Um, that's just one point. Oh, what, what I wanted to ask is, I mean, you brought the key problem of Japan uh, just a few seconds, a um, few minutes ago, shrinkage of population. I mean, um, immigration is uh, a band-aid solution for the immediate future, but it doesn't solve the basic problem uh, of um, the shrinking population, which, uh, well, according to to all the um, demographic uh, forecasts, we are going to be, but by the time I die, it's probably be a, below 100 million, and uh, well, and so on. So ultimately, are we going to have 100% uh, Chinese and Vietnamese in Japan to to maintain the population? What is uh, what Abe has been most um, well, trying to ex to um, to avoid, and even Mr. Ishiba brought it up in in uh, in the to in the talks about the uh, election at the of the uh, of the LDP at that time. Um, the the main problem is what is Japan going to do about the um, uh, to to. To to, re well, to 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 amend or to to improve the situation that at least I mean we, we, he's talking now about 1.81, which is still a terrible decrease, but it's better than what we have now. <laughs> so um, Abe should instead of grandstanding all over the world, he should try to start to, to, to settle the problems here in Japan. And the main problem is, how do we maintain the population of Japan? What is your opinion on this subject? Thank you. Do you want to go or do, do you want to go? OK. Um, I have two views on that. Uh, one is, is definitely we need a society to accept more babies, meaning that we have to raise the birth rate. I mean, as you, as you said, it's uh, currently it's around 1.4, and the government is trying to achieve the 1.8. And and I think the you know this uh, transforming the society to accept uh, uh, babies, even the uh, parents are not married. I mean, like a style in France. That's one way to go. And also, uh, we need a definitely uh, big reforms in the uh, working environment that you know the, the mothers can easily take uh, vacations and. Uh, uh, husbands, I mean, parents, fathers can easily take a vacation as well for the child's care. That sort of a transformation is definitely necessary. But as you said, going to the you know 2.07 in the birth rate, which is a rate to maintain the current uh, uh, population, I mean level of the population, that looks very very challenging and probably impossible. So going to the second point, I feel, how do you define the Japanese? I know, bio, bio, how do you say, biologically. biologically, maybe, you know, they are not the Japanese, but if they are culturally and socially, they feel we are belonging to this society, this, I feel, wonderful society as a Japanese, I think it's fine. I, I, I don't have any problem of having somebody sitting be, be, uh, beside me I mean, uh, hopefully speaking Japanese, that, you know, as a Japanese, they pay taxes, they, pay, uh, they do the, uh, the social duties. What's wrong with that? That's my sense. Therefore, as you know, in a global population at the moment, uh, s uh, 7 billion I mean, people, in 2050, it's nine, uh, around 100 billion. So global population is continuing to rise. Why can't Japan accept more people? I, say, I don't say foreigners, I say people as a new Japanese. That's one, I mean, second thing I, it's a bit, bit, bit too liberal and too, too idealistic, but that's one way of thinking. Um, a bit of the uh, arithmetic. Um, the every year 1.2 million die, 0.8 million born, 0.4 million decline of population. 
and foreigners 0.2 million increase. So still the gap is 0.2 million. And of course, we have several different scenarios. I think the opening of the market, I think, the much more aggressively. And, and why not, I think, taking foreigners not you know, 0.2 million every year, but 1.5 million, and couples, young, and let them have a baby here in Japan, and, and so forth. Um, I would say, I think, the realistically, uh, it, it would be probably impossible to fill that gap of, you know, 0.2 million in my understanding. So uh, we can probably, uh, you know, control or slightly lower the pace of decline of population by migration, but not more than that. And the question is the how the you know, social system, a fiscal system, and everything, uh, how to adjust sh shrinking population. And we have to redesign, again, medical pension and everything. Um, so we have to give up pension system, what? But again, you know, nobody can think about that easily because you know, the, when the whole system will collapse, it's very difficult to tell. And you know, look at the politician, and they're already too old to think about that because I think they don't care. <laughs> Abe-san's time is what? Only two and a half years to go from here? So I would say there will be no realistic solutions from the government, but this is not a problem. You know, the, 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 they're, they're not so um, serious, but I think the point is even they're serious, they cannot easily have the, you know, any, any kind of strong views about what is happening and when and so forth. And then finally they, they feel, uh, I, will, I will have died already before that happens. So, okay, uh, what is it, to, dinner tonight and so forth then? So, so that, that is the situation. I think the, um, this issue has to be tackled by the whole generation. Not only the current in politicians, I think the you know maybe even the like twenties, even kids, but uh, I would say again the issue is more on how to adjust the whole economic system, social system to a gradual shrinking population, and I don't know. I mean, I I may have already died. I mean. By, by, by the you don't know that. that you don't know that you know, I, I don't I don't want to I want to you know, live until 100 years old I'm saying impossible I can I can stop do you think so 80. do you really think so that you <laughs> cannot live in 100, until 100 years old I mean in 10 years time the technology will tell you that yeah, when you find small tiny cancers you can find it easily and as you know 20 years ago we used to say cancer is a disease to die now the cancers are you know uh, curable. No, e even if you can cure a cancer, you're a muscle. But I mean, you, do, do you, you know, you think the, do you, you know, you walk. know, but you know the IPS, <laughs> Ciro. You can make, I mean, have you guys read the Homo Deus? You know, you should read the Homo Deus. That's a very exciting book that makes the technology will change the dynamics. I mean, I, I, maybe you're right that the, uh, within our uh, lifetime, I mean, Reasonable life right, time horizon, that's impossible. But in. It's a tragedy, you know. You, five, yeah, but, if you cannot retire. But if your body is fine. I'm looking for my retirement. <laughs> I know. I, I, I know. I know you for quite a long time. And I used to, you say that about 20 years ago already. <laughs> but anyway, but going back to the point, you know, technologies and the social change may not allow you to retire and not, you know, Think about the future. Wow, well, disaster. Maybe you feel that way, but that's what the society uh, I mean, you know, demands you. So uh, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the shrinking population issue is definitely a big uh, you know, concern for the uh, many people in this country. And, but at the same time, I always feel that the global population is continuing to increase. How do we reconcile these issues?
No questions? Okay, I have a quick one. You, you mentioned Anglo-Saxons earlier. Mm -hmm. um, we have Mr. Abe currently in the UK. Mm -hmm. He uh, met Mrs. Uh, May yesterday, and he made a plea to the British people to vote for the British Parliament to vote for Mrs. May's plan to mm -hmm. stay for the, her Brexit plan. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's looking increasingly unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, so, therefore, we face a possible scenario of a no-deal Brexit, a hard mm -hmm. Brexit, mm -hmm. what impact would that have short term and longer term on global markets? Could we see a big shock hitting global markets or do you think this is all priced in um, for now? Um, yeah, just what do you see the impact of this? Maybe start with um, with you, Shilakao-san or Adachi-san. Okay, I start. Okay. Um, in the short term, I think it's not fully priced in. I think there is still hope. I mean. I mean, JP Morgan is rather optimistic on this issue that yeah, there will be no hard Brexit. I mean, hard, I mean, hard Brexit is very unlikely. That's our view. And I think the market consensus view is sort of a delaying the timing. I mean, no ultimate solutions, but still just delaying the timing to decide. So that makes the, uh, you know, sort of muddling through this issue in the short term. And the longer term, I don't know. I personally don't know how what the Europeans will do in this, you know, yeah, EU as a whole. And uh, I, I, I can definitely see the uh, tension within the continent that they want to divide rather than integrate. So, in context of this, uh, you know, integration, how come UK be joining this confusion in the continent? I don't think that people in the UK prefer to go that way. So, separation is probably the medium term uh, prospect. But the longer term, one day we have to coordinate some, you know, more integrations. Not like a current EU style, but more broad global government or something. That's maybe longer term story. But in a, in a, at least in the medium term, for a couple of five, say five years' time, I think the, uh, there's no choice for the, but the UK just try I and mean, separate from the continent for a while. Mm -hmm. So, but, not such a huge risk? Uh, in, uh, if the hard Brexit actually happens, mm -hmm. I think the market will get the hit. Mm -hmm. That's my sense. But not deteriorating, I mean, not uh, plunging the US to the recession or something. That's unlikely to happen, mm -hmm. but uh, some big shock. That's, right. that's quite possible. Yeah, I think, I think yeah, the macro impact is, is quite probably, I don't say quite limited, but I think it's also limited, mainly because of the um, you know, significance of the UK economy. Um, you know, near-term market correction is quite possible, but not more than that, in my understanding. But the point is, I think the, even though um, you, know, you say hard Brexit um, or no deal, in reality, they may have some system which is not necessarily hugely damaging the two economies, UK economy and uh, European economy. So, you know, no agreement, nothing, but I think, they, okay, you know, we're gonna, for the moment, we're gonna do this and do that in terms of the trade between the two, two economies. So, um, so in that sense, we are, even though hard Brexit in, in, in your definition happens, I don't think the market's really uh, impacted for a sustained period of time. Um, but again, you know, the, 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 the broader issue is the, this is a, you know, emergence of the, you know, nationalism in the U.S., U.K., and what is happening to the other economies or other countries. Like, maybe, you know, Germany may be affected, maybe. So I think we are more interested in knock-on effect mm. of this kind of events to the other, other countries which might be skewed toward more nationalistic approach, or some conservative guys may start to shout and so forth. So I think that may have some significant impact over the longer run. But for the moment, we, we do not think you know, a huge impact on the global economy. Maybe you know, pound starting go, that goes down, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not necessarily a huge impact, you know, hugely impacting the other, other currencies. Right. Don't be shy. Oh, over here. Yeah. 
My name is Yuta Kahokura, associate member of the club. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have one question. Uh, ASEAN economy is heavily dependent on Chinese economy. And Japan has a very close economic relation with ASEAN. So you suggested about the lowering of the economic growth of China to, well, say 6.2%, you said. And then uh, if I could have your opinion or view about the indirect uh, impact of Chinese uh, downturn through ASEAN, I'll be very happy. Thank you. You are better to attack numbers, so go ahead. <laughs> uh, yes, I think the, um, we are expecting, yeah, ASEAN economy grows to slow down as well. Uh, yeah, mainly impacted by Chinese economic slowdown. Um, but I think the, it might be a bit different. Uh, well, you know, uh, sorry, I think the country by country, some different uh, situations in, in my understanding. Uh, generally speaking, of course, you know, the Chinese downturn will affect ASEAN economy. But I think the, 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 the point is the Chinese demand slowdown will affect ASEAN economy. But in the meantime, uh, if uh, developed economies invest in China will, you know, sl will, will go there. But in the meantime, the, as a destination, some money may go into ASEAN economy. So um, in, in that sense, you know, we are fairly uh, optimistic about the, that sort of money flow, uh, which is shifting from China to uh, other, industri other, other countries. And in particular, we are optimistic about Vietnam and also maybe with Thailand as well. Uh, so this is more, I think, the you know, diversification issue of the global manufacturing industry. And so far, we haven't yet seen any major change in the money flow or investment flow. But the, if the trade disputes continue to heat up and if the China's outlook goes down meaningfully, uh, also China's currency doesn't matter. If the yuan starts to appreciate, possibly you know, putting pressure, you know, getting pressure from Trump administration, that may raise a cost of produce in China, and that may be, have a positive impact on ASEAN economy. So we have both. So some positive impact and some negative impact. And so far, we are a bit cautious on the cautious side, uh, but not necessarily uh, in a free, um, what the totally pessimist about ASEAN, even if China shows them because of some positive impact. Yeah, um, I share the same view that the, uh, there's a, always a positive and negative in this kind of issue, you know, because it, basically China's domestic demand slows, then that's definitely negative for the ASEAN countries. But at the same time, this global supply chain shift from China to the uh, other countries, and the other countries usually uh, low-income countries in ASEAN. So as uh, Shirakazan said, Vietnam is a one country, and uh, maybe, maybe uh, my, my sense is not Thailand, but Malaysia and others. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, the shift of the global supply chain will benefit the ASEANs rather than uh, in a more sort of medium term perspective, I feel. OK, thank you. May I have another one? Oh, of course you can. <laughs> Don't be shy. Well, once again, because it's very good to have, an, as an associate member, to have the opportunity <laughs> to ask some question once in a while. Um, connected with what we were talking about, I'd like to have a, a look at uh, by or explanation by you about the uh, financial aspects. Uh, we had uh, the. Some time ago, we had uh, at the Swiss Chamber of Commerce, we had Mr. the president of, um, oh, um, well, <laughs> uh, the, the, the trade organization, Japanese trade. Um, Jetro. De Jetro. Jetro, exactly. You, you got it. <laughs> Jetro. And th this, this problem was uh, pretty much uh, discussed on that occasion. And uh, one of the conclusions which I would like you to talk about is that 
in a, in a de with the declining uh, <clears throat> population in Japan, you get very little foreign investment coming into Japan. In fact, uh, uh, in all the statistics about foreign foreign exchange, uh, and, uh, for foreign investment, sorry, foreign investment, uh, Japan is at four percent, about on the on the very low side, uh, compared to I mean, United States, 40, 50 percent, even France. By the by the way, France managed to get the 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 birth rate up from 1.6 to 2.0, but France has. Uh, 30% of uh, the economy is foreign investments. And on the other side, the Japanese companies, they have all the money. They're not spending it in Japan. They are all go going abroad. And all the, the, uh, the, the benefits of the uh, abenomics are all felt all over the, all over the, uh, the world. And uh, we have just Hitachi buying a big Swiss company, uh, uh, getting out of nuclear, which is another very good thing. <laughs> so uh, uh, how, how do you see the, the flow of money on a macro, uh, on a macro scale, uh, which, uh, which uh, can support Japan also from a financial point of view. I mean, I feel still that Abesan should make greater efforts to get to to distribute the money among the population. The main reason uh, Japanese are not marrying and not having children is lack of money. 70% give that as the main reason. And uh, um, Young people, until they're 27, 28, they cannot afford to get married. But the financial, the financial flow is very important. It's, the, it's really the blood of the economy, which is, uh, which is also having a, a great impact on the, on the uh, birth rate. So please, about the finances, what do you think macro finances? Thank you so much. Hmm. Um, you know, first of all, <coughs> you know, the, uh, as Adat San touched upon in the previous uh, uh, comments, um, you know, our country is the learning uh, external surplus, means we don't need the money on that basis. We are still a uh, capital exporting country. So we have abundant money, as you mentioned, and our corporate sector is running sub uh, net saving, and we're exporting capital to the outside of the country. And I think from macro perspectives, that is not necessarily so bad, because I think the, if, if the investment is good enough, Japanese economy will benefit from income surplus increases, which is happening. But in the meantime, as you mentioned, the, this uh, oversaving situation means you know, our economy, in particular final demand, is, is not so strong, and we are shrinking population and so forth. So what you're talking about is, simply speaking, we need to do, be, you know, to, to do more of the transfer of money through bank, government sector. So your view seems to be saying such that, OK, we're going to do tax more on companies and getting money, and that be distributed to the household sector. I don't think that's really changing, uh, in theory, the country's external surplus situation, because I think the Current situation is government, for, for example, deficit is like 3% of GDP, external surplus 4% of GDP means private sector's sa net savings like 7% of GDP. If we tax on companies that money through government sector to be redistributed to the household sector, but that means unless household sector uses that money, unchanged net external balance. So we have to, you have to assume that, OK, if we give money, getting money from corporate sector companies to, and, and give money to household sector consumers, you have to have assumption that consumers start to spend money or start to get married. But I don't think that that is an easy story. So structural problem of Japan is the you know, people are not so optimistic about the future, saving money, and companies as well. So this is, I think, you know, it's not necessarily the BCL uh, cycle, but this is a structural thing. And break that situation is not necessarily easy. Well, I think the, what, what, what you, ha you seem to be suggesting of 
uh, money transfers through government sector between you know, corporate and households is not necessarily a good solution. We, what we have to have is the, uh, you know, better income growth prospects by household into the future and how are we gonna do that? So that's the issue. So it's kind of the egg and chicken issue, but I think the, you know, um, uh, that question, you have to ask the young generation because already we are too old, right? So if you, if you, why you are not getting money? It's not necessarily only the problem of the money. The problem is when maybe different, diff different, you know, in your case, but in my case, like 20, 20s, I borrowed the money a lot and my financial balance was in deficit, but fine. And I got married and then have a kid. So, Financial constraint you're talking about is not necessarily the income constraint. We have to talk about financial constraint. That is, I think, the, if you want to borrow money, they, they don't lend money. That is a problem. But but the point is, the they do not want to borrow money. So if I look at my 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 children, they want to continue to save, 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 save. I always say you don't save money. You have to spend money, but they save. So. That issue is not necessarily a generational issue, but I think the, I, I do not have any you know, good answer to your question because uh, we can tell them, get married, spend money, but they don't. How, how are we gonna do that? It's not corporate issue, I think, in my view. Yeah, um, yeah I, I basically share the same view that the, uh, this is not the uh, the government sort of, you know, directly managed to change. I mean, this is real social, uh, collective recognition that the future is this small, therefore we say. I mean, that's, that's very difficult to change the dynamics, I feel. And it's, uh, we, I feel that's very shared by the, not only the household, but also corporate as well. And uh, as you said, that uh, many Japanese corporates, I mean, especially the big ones, which is operating globally, they decide to expand the business overseas, not in, can in Japan. Because I feel th it's easy to argue that this market outside of Japan is continuing to expand. But in Japan, both demand from the total population and also labor force shrinking. How come you invest into the, this country? And that's, it's a sort of equivalent, or I mean, low equivalent of people feel, I mean, chicken and egg, eggs issue, that people feel the future is bad, that's why we don't invest. That makes these things <coughs> vicious cycle. But so what the, we can probably do as a ideally is to change the dynamics of the future. I mean, it's, it's not the income of the now, current income, it's a permanent income that we have to change. But uh, nobody knows how we change this permanent income expectation, at the moment, at least. Okay, Albert had his hand up at the back there. Well, I'll give a, a slight bit of um, uh, input here. So I uh, have two so children now. Name and affiliation. Albert Siegel. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm freelance. And uh, I have uh, two children. Um, the youngest one is two months uh, old. Uh, the other one is um, uh, two years old. And it was a very difficult decision to have the children. Uh, my wife and I are both working. And we both need to work, obviously, because we have to pay bills. But um, to, we, we had a very strong debate about whether or not to have children. We were very close to not having them. And um, the biggest factors were, um, uh, you know, we don't have any family in Tokyo. It's just her and I, so we have no one to help out. Uh, like the situation is for many people here. And um, one of us would have to get off work, which would make things uh, quite difficult. And then um, even if it's only temporary, it's okay. But if it's long, a permanent thing, like permanent housewife, permanent house husband, whatever the situation may be, it's, it's nearly impossible to maintain uh, a healthy uh, financial situation with children because you have to think about the children, the education of the children in the long term. So um, we were lucky enough to be able to get to day, uh, get daycare fairly quickly, very young for um, for the daughter and the son. We're still working on, 
But uh, I think this is the problem that many people face, uh, many young couples face, is it's not, um, it's not well, it, um, all about the money, but it's a major factor in it because, um, yes, you can give someone a raise, you can give more money, distribute more money, but it's not going to do any good if only one person is going to be able to receive this. Uh, young couples, young families do absolutely need um, assistance from um, healthcare facilities um, in uh, child care and these kind of things. And um, I think that uh, probably plays a major role for most people in deciding. And the thing is, with um, with this uh, culture we have now, with the way things have changed culturally, um, less and less people are willing to take the risk because we don't have um, as many people living together in a family unit as there were in the previous generations, where the children and um, the parents and grandparents live together. Everyone wants to live on their own. So when you when you get to the situation where everybody has to earn money, um, you can't suddenly cut in half the income. Uh, by having one parent stay at home. So this is why many people are choosing not to have children uh, because um, it's not only the difficulties they face for themselves, but the possible future difficulties for their children. And of course, you have all these stories about children in, right now who can, can't even eat except at school because that's the only meals they get. Um, I think... Um, I'm not sure if it would be economically viable because you're talking about a redistribution of um, income uh, to some individuals. But I mean, wouldn't it make more sense to basically, and I don't know if it's economically viable, to um, greatly increase these um, assistances and services and such to encourage parents to have children, people to have children, encourage them to get married, have children, tax breaks and such. Um, but also make sure, and it's not just about encouraging to have the children, but also give them the support they need to be able to confidently um, maintain the children. I mean, schools are expensive. I mean, you know, it's there's just so much beyond just what's for dinner. Okay, thanks. Oh, the question is, other, 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 <laughs> other ways to do this. Mm, I mean, yeah, man. I don't know. I'm, I'm not so expert on this issue, but uh, my sense is that the government is at least touching on this issue by, as you know, free education when the VAT hike is coming. You know, that's k kind of initiatives they are at least trying to do something. And uh, Abe in the last six years, always said that they're trying, uh, he's trying to increase the, the I mean, facility, uh, care facilities for children, and uh, they're trying, and he's supporting women to have more babies. And so, uh, yeah, I know it's in reality at the moment there's many problems, but direction from the government is trying to, uh, not solve, but tr try to ease the pains for young couples to have a baby. So that's definitely the changes we are seeing. But uh, as I, I, I totally understand that the speed and uh, extent is much, much less than the, what desirable. But, you know, but the more big pictures, if you continue this direction, we have to have a more fiscal expenditures. And uh, we have already big government debt. So it means, it effectively means we have to transfer the income from senior people to the young couples. And is that really possible in this, you know, in this democratic society? I'm not so sure. I mean, I think, I think the direction is that uh, what, what you are requesting, but how much, how fast, it's quite difficult. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Uh, we should not mix up the issue of population shrinkage and uh, difficulty of raising kids because, you know, the statistics are speaking. What the biggest problem is the population of the um, young women has come down. That's a problem. And plus, uh, marriage rate has, has come down. So if you take a look at statistics, the married couple still, on average, having two kids, and some three. The problem is the married couples, in terms of number, has shrinking, and because of the marriage average, you know, the age of marriage has come up. Maybe you know difficult for us to have uh, expect the three kids kind of families. So there's a macro issue. That macro issue, if you mix up with kind of, kind of you know, the is raising kids is a bit difficult kind of thing. I, I'm still saying, you know, the, the, the issue is how we gonna keep the population of the young women 
from macro perspectives, if you talk about population, that, that's an issue and how we're going to get people get married rather than get having baby and uh, having baby. So I think the, the point is, okay, we're going to do uh, spend more money on families to, to have third kids and fourth. That could work, but the macro trend will not be easily reversed if marriage rate continues to go down and average age of marriage continues to go up. So, and again, you know, this is in, already in the pipeline. Um, so I think the, again, macro population issue and this issue is a bit different issue in my understanding and it's not easy for to resolve the macro population shrinkage issue only by changing the uh, social system helping uh, marriage to couple. So, because I'm macroeconomist, I'm thinking about macro population, GDP, and so forth, right? Well, I, we know that we, you know, the difficulty is there, and that is mainly because of the shortage of maybe you know, uh, child care houses, maybe, and also um, the, we don't have the babysitter as much in you know, many babysitters in, in Japan. So, that could be resolved somewhat by immigration policy, maybe. Uh, but still, it is not a, a perfect solution or the uh, effective solution to tackle with the population issue. I have a bit different view on that. Um, yes, from the macro perspective, it's at the moment it's uh, we are seeing uh, we are uh, observing that the uh, young women are shrinking already, and so even their birth rate continue to rise, say more than two, uh, two point zero. Uh, our shrinking population continues. So that's true that the, uh, uh, if we don't, uh, if we cannot increase the number of the young women at the moment, it, we have to accept the shrinking population continues. That's, I understand. But from here, what we can do, I think the, we should prepare the society having a more babies and having, having a e easy for the young couples to have a more babies. So I think the, uh, you know. But uh, yeah. maybe you're talking about three on average. Yes. We, we, you know, in order for us to stop the shrinkage population, we have to have three kids on average. Yes, that's right. So. The, the, I mean, three or four, that's, I think it's possible. <laughs> I think it's possible so that, that the. Uh, that uh, issue, I, I still think, I don't know, I mean, what is it in the UK? I mean, three kids. It's pretty common. Pretty common, yeah. So we have to talk about why not, why not three in Japan, why not on, why only two in Japan kind of issue. So I, I understand, yeah. yeah. Okay, we're running out of time now, so maybe make this the final question. Sorry, you had. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I have a question for both experts Say here. Your name uh, and I'm Aaron, Aaron Ye with Xinhua News Agency. And I want to ask about your opinion uh, about Japan's recent uh, exit tax, the 1,000 yen in our tickets. Mm. And do you think it's going to drive away uh, foreign visitors who want to come to Japan from actually coming to Japan? And uh, there's also a big concern that uh, the money might not be properly used and it might go to uh, <laughs> utter waste. So uh, what's your opinion about this tax? Thank you very much. Um, maybe uh, may, it may sound a little bit excused, but uh, from macro perspective, or we always say macro perspective, <laughs> you know, uh, the amount of the taxes is quite. I feel it's relatively small, so I don't think the introduction of this tax itself will reduce the number of the in, in, in inbound tourists. I, I think that's that's not the case. But uh, I share your view that the, uh, there's a possibility or maybe risk that this uh, you know, collected uh, tax revenues will not be used wisely and uh, maybe wastefully. That's quite possible, and uh, I, I'm always skeptical on that kind of uh, uh, how they use their money, and uh, we should be very careful on the impact by, uh, by the, uh, uh, this kind of new taxes. But uh, going back to the macro perspective, I think the more important issue for the inbound tourists is not the tax, it's more currency or economic conditions in Asia. 
I feel that the structurally or secularly, the uh, tourist demand in Asia will continue to rise as income of, of average people in over there will continue to rise. And I think that Japan is a good direct, a good destination for the many Asians. Uh, so the increase I mean, the, of the uh, uh, inbound tourists will continue. That's my sense. However, at the same time, I want to emphasize that you know, 40 million uh, tourists in 2020 is very, very challenging. It, at the moment, we are seeing the pace of increase is now uh, getting slower. Mm. Yeah, I think that from a macro perspective, I think that the amount of the tax correction is small. And uh, maybe used for, I don't know, renovating airport terminals, maybe. Um, I think the, this is a symbolic thing. Uh, the government seems to be saying, uh, we, are, we are collecting money from you. Uh, we are not necessarily, from here, uh, significantly increasing tourist inflow. And 1,000 yen could be 2,000 yen in five years' time, 3,000 yen in 10 years' time. But the point is, from the viewpoint of the availability of you know, the uh, hotels and so forth, I think the maybe 30 million per year is a kind of the good number. We don't necessarily have to have 50 million. It's a bit too much. So I think this is a kind of too much kind of announcement by the government, in my view. OK, we're going to have to stop it there now. Um, thank you very much for attending today. And thank you both for some provoking and thought-provoking um, comments there, much appreciated, and I'm hoping it's not going to become a global recession in the next few years, but... Hopefully. Hopefully. Chances of a recession next year globally? Next year? Yeah, roughly. Percent. Personal view, of course. Uh, <laughs> less than 50. Less than 50. Personal view. That's okay. House view is ten percent. Ten percent. My personal view, eighty. Eighty. <laughs> you have a very difficult situation. Twenty. Okay. On that pessimistic note, um, I'd like to give you both. In two years, right? Oh, in two years. Yeah. Okay, eighty yeah. percent. No, not next year. Not, not next year. year. Uh, not this year. Not this year. I mean, I think the common views. I mean, I think we have to talk about the will be tw 20 or 21. That's the time that the people will be very difficult, difficult situation. Yeah. Yes. OK. We should have called this um, economic um, views of 2020, not 2019. Please do not write 80%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be careful on that uh, okay. uh, comment on that. OK, yeah. anyway, I'd like to thank you. Here's a, a year's membership to the club. Um, please come and use the new facilities to both of you. <laughs> okay, big round of applause, please.